There will always be places like theatres and cinemas where people can come together and experience the same thing. Read everything and learn to write for everything. With an incredibly diverse body of work, Mike Hodges is one of Britain's most exciting directors. In this episode of Conversations, we interview Mike about his career. From the sensational debut Get Carter in 1971 to his dark and brooding later films, Croupier and I'll Sleep When I'm Dead. You are watching Conversations from DLD College in London. Thank you for joining us, Mike. Your feature film career began with Get Carter in 1971. Can you tell us a little bit about how you became involved as a writer and director? Well, I worked in television for about 15 years, or 10 or 15 years before I eventually got to make Get Carter. And I worked on current affairs programs I, uh, like World in Action, which was a very famous program in, in those days. And we worked on 16 millimeter film totally. And that took me to America, took me to do profiles on, uh, on Barry Goldwater Jr., who was the Republican candidate. It took me to Vietnam. It took me to all sorts of occasions, and places like that. I then did uh, an arts program called Tempo, which we did profiles of all sorts of people like Harold Pinter, Orson Welles, uh, Jean-Luc Godard. Um, and then I reached a point where I wanted to do drama. So I wrote a script, uh, a very personal script in, uh, at the time, uh, called Suspect, which was a thriller. But the thriller, I, I realized early on that I wanted to use the thriller to uh, explore the, the underbelly of, of, of the country, the society that I was living in. And the thriller seems to me is a great vehicle for, for doing that. So, I made Suspect, which is a 90-minute film on 16 millimeter, and then I did a second one, which was called Rumor. Which now Rumor was about the the freedom of the press. It was about a sleazy gossip columnist who is being fed a rumor, a story which nobody can validate, uh, and what he doesn't realize is that he's being suckered into uh, a situation where he's murdered, and that means that this the rumor will become fact. So these two films were both 90 minutes, and they were shot on 16 millimeter. And they were seen by a producer called Michael Klinger, who had the rights to a book called Jack's Return Home by Ted Lewis. Uh, and he sent me the, the novella, and I liked it. And he said, would you like to write and direct it? So I, needless to say, yet said yes. And I received it in January, and I was shooting the film in July. And I had no idea, I have no idea quite how Michael Kane became involved. Uh, but I suspect that he was involved probably early, much earlier than I was led to believe because mm -hmm. they were waiting to see whether he liked my script, I would think. Anyway, that's how I came to make Get Carter. Um, you were quoted as once saying, I really want to take the audience by the hand and take them somewhere they haven't been before. Can you elaborate on how far you consider the audience response when developing a script? Oh, I, um, I mean, first of all, obviously the choice of subject will uh, 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 allow you to take an audience to a place that's, that's your own. What I meant by the, the line is that as a filmmaker, you have to create a, a basically a bubble, a place which is your own. You, it comes out of your imagination. Um, and you try to make it a different one to the normal formulaic. I mean, when Carter came out at the time, uh, it was very advanced sort of film in a sense. Um, it's been copied many times since, uh, but at the time it was quite a cinematic breakthrough. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one way that I took uh, took the audience into a place they had not been to before. Most of the gangster films up until then, the British gangster films were were you know they were sort of well they were kind of they were soft. Whereas I lived in a world where the Cray brothers and the Richardsons 
And from my experiences on World in Action, I knew that these people were ruthless and horrendous and scary. Uh, so when I was offered Get Carter, which was about a, a hitman, yeah. I wanted to make it as real and as rough as possible. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thanks. Um, following the, uh, the success of Get Carter, you reteamed with Michael Caine to make Pulp. Can you tell us a little about where the concept uh, of the film came from? Well, <coughs> one, I, after having adapted a, a novel, which I'd never done before for the Get Carter, I wanted to go back to writing an original, which is what I'd done in Suspect and Rumour. And I also, something happened to me, really, because whilst Carter's a grim film, uh, and with television, you see, you, you, you make it for yourself, in a sense. You never see it with an audience, because it's transmitted out through small screens all over the world or country or wherever. Uh, whereas with a feature film, you get to see the film when you initially make it with audiences. Yeah. And one of the nicest experiences for me is, even though Carter is a grim film, there's some very funny things in mm. it. And I heard people laughing. So I w wanted to make people laugh. And I wrote this film called Pulp, uh, which was a serious film, but it was still comedic in many ways. It, was, uh, it, it happened, uh, it was a totally original script, because I was a, there was a, an election in Italy uh, where the fascist party suddenly re-emerged and the, the percentage was about 10% of the populace voted for the fascist party. Now, if you're my age and you've been through the Second World War, you would never have dreamt that the fascists could return. You just thought that after all the things that we'd experienced in the Second World War, uh, the, the one thing that would never return would be fascism. Mm -hmm. So that was the initial uh, uh, sort of uh, trigger to what I wanted to write. I also wanted to write, uh, then I also remembered a, a very famous uh, uh, scandal that had happened in Italy in the 50s called the Montesi scandal, where a young woman was found on a beach. And it was the beginning of the paparazzi in Italy. Mm -hmm. And Fellini's uh, later films, Old Givita and all of those, feature the sort of paparazzi. So well, these were all elements that I started bringing into the script, which was. Uh, which, which was also an exploration of why people want to see violent films. And it was a, a complex story, more than, uh, but I'm taking, the, I'm, I'm joking about the, the complexity of, of what I'm doing. I used a narrative voiceover, mm -hmm. uh, which was a kind of parody of Mickey Spillane and writers like, uh, you know, like Raymond Chandler and people like that, that you probably wouldn't know about. But a lot of the things I'm talking about you won't know about, I'm afraid. <laughs> That's what happens when you get old. The gap grows spider. You're <laughs> listening, fine. Like maybe I'll prompt you to go see, find out various things. Um, the Terminal Man yeah. was your first foray into science fiction and another adaptation. How conscious are you of the genre when you approach a film, or do you simply focus on the character and the narrative? Well, like each film... Uh, demands, I think, a different approach. Uh, and The Terminal Man was a very bleak film. It was an adaptation of a novel by Michael Crichton. Do you know who Michael Crichton is? Um, no. I well, he, uh, was, he had a big TV series, which was called, what was the TV series that Crichton did? Can't remember. What on earth was it? It was a very big American medical series. He was a doctor, actually. Uh, anyway, he wrote... Uh, well, then, of course, he went on to write the, the big film that Spielberg made. Jurassic Park. Um? Jurassic Park. That Jurassic Park, I think so. so that he's, yeah, he's, a, that. he's basically an author. Uh, uh, and he did direct some films. Anyway, he, he'd written this book, which was a very bleak uh, take on science. The Terminal Man is, is about some, a, a man who has had a serious car accident yeah. and has violent fits. Uh, they try everything, psych psychotherapy, they try drugs, and nothing seems to work. So he agrees to an experimental surgery, which is to implant into his brain electrodes, uh, 25, I think about 25 or something like that. And they then test each of the electrodes because they're trying to get into one of the pleasure cells. So that when the attacks come on, it'll be aborted automatically by a computer, which is fitted into his, uh, into his chest and it'll, it'll abort it by touching, go, going to the pleasure cells. Needless to say, because it's a drama, uh, 
uh, the experiment goes wrong. Yeah. He, in other words, he likes the pleasure cells being, being uh, activated and therefore he uh, it speeds up the, the whole series. So it's a, a tragedy. Now, uh, so it is a science fiction film. I wanted to make it in black and white, but Warner Brothers didn't like that idea. So I just restricted the color uh, that I used in the film. So all you have is black, white, and f flesh colors. And then when I wanted certain moments uh, to bring in color, like at the very end, there's a, a Mexican funeral, um, in, uh, uh, and it, it suddenly becomes absolutely full of color. Uh, so it was a deliberate uh, effect to have. And, cho and the choice of music, again, was very simple. I just used one of Goldberg variations, just the piano. That was the whole the music that I used. So the science fiction element, which is, is no longer science fiction, this, of course, it's science fact now, mm -hmm. um, is uh, because you see a lot of surgery I've seen since I met it, um, that it really uh, you see replicated w exactly what was happening. Um, so I just wanted to give the film, again, it's taking an audience into a place where they've not been before. And I created a world which is our own world. We created our own hospital, our own uniforms, our own uh, uh, operating system, basically. So the masks that the doctor, the surgeons wore were, were like spaceships, you know. So that's, again, going back <coughs> to taking the audience by the hand and put, putting them somewhere where they've not yeah. been before. Um, there have been aspects of your career that were somewhat tumultuous. Have you found filmmaking to be bittersweet? Uh, yes, it's tough. It's yeah. just, I mean, um, uh, there are a lot of egos out there, and well, basically you're often hired for your instincts, and then the producers and various people try to remove your instincts. Um, it's a very curious process, but uh, and you have to fight hard to get... Uh, if you're interested in the film, quite a lot of directors don't really maybe necessarily care too much about yeah. the film, so they acquiesce to the, the needs of the, of the studio heads or the money men. Uh, whereas I had a clear uh, vision of what I wanted to do and what I thought was commercial too, and what the audience wanted, which didn't always coincide with the producers. So there were, I had quite a few fights in the 80s. But now I only work with people I like and trust, <laughs> which means I don't work very much these days. Uh, the satirical humour, which was evident in your earlier work, comes to the forefront in the cult favourite Flash Gordon. What attracted, what attracted you to this project? Uh, I needed the money. Um, so, no, I mean, was, I, I, Nick, Nick Rogue was originally going to make Flash Gordon. So I, uh, and Dino De Laurentiis, who was the, the last great sort of film um, mogul, really, um, had wanted me to make the sequel, and I didn't want to make the sequel. So anyway, he and Nick Rogue fell out, and I, uh, he approached me to take over. Um, and I was a totally inappropriate director for it in many ways. Um, I, because I'd never done special effects, I, you know, I'd end, I'd, at that point I had done a studio film, which is the terminal line, because I shot a lot of that in the studio. Uh, but I w didn't know much about comics, I'd not been brought up on Flash Gordon, uh, which was a Saturday morning film for, for a lot of young people see, but I, never, I didn't go to the Saturday morning s cinema. So I was an unlikely director. Anyway, I had two sons who were then about 10 or 11, and I said, do you think I should make it? And they said, yes. So I made it. And I'm really glad I made it because we had an, an amazing amount of fun doing it. And the reason I think if, that it's, it has whatever quality you have, and people will vary obviously in terms, is that because we had, I, one, I never th thought the film would ever see the light of a projector. I just didn't, we didn't really know what we were doing, to be truthful. But we just, <laughs> and because I had a totally Italian art department, including Fellini, Federico Fellini. Do you know who Fellini is? Uh, I think I've heard of him. Fine. Okay, yeah. Federico Fellini's production designer, whom I learned a lot from, but he didn't speak any English. And the Italians didn't, I didn't speak any Italian, so the, I don't think they even read the script properly. But, <laughs> so I just had to make it up as I went along. So every day I'd go in, there was no way I could control the film. Yeah. And I think as a result of that kind of uh, approach to it, it has a, a, a sort of souffle quality to it. And what I love, love about it is the, the primary colours. It's not like Star Wars grey mm. and things. Flash Gordon, you know, it's primary colours. So uh, I basically, it's a, it is a reproduction of the original strip cartoon by 
uh, and, uh, and which, which was in color. So I didn't have to fight, really, to make it into... It's, it's more of a, uh, of a strip cartoon film than any other one that's been made, practically, I think. Certainly more than Star Wars, because yeah. it is... Uh, it stuck very closely to the, to the cartoon, I, the angles that we chose to shoot it in, and so on. And it was fun to do, uh, and it's brought a lot of joy to people, I think, over the years. In the late 1980s, you also wrote and directed Black Rainbow. The film was produced by Goldcrest Films. Did you find the landscape of British cinema had changed a great deal at this point? Well, there isn't really a British film industry, you see. When I made Get Carter, it was sort of the fag end of the British film yeah. industry. You must understand, in the 50s and even in the 60s, uh, there was an industry, there were studios, uh, there were like rank, brothers, you know, it's the equivalent of America. Uh, but the Americans basically did the same thing as they did to the, uh, the aircraft industry in this, car, in this country. They just crushed it. They wanted no competition. So the first of all, they took over the d distribution. So if you've got no way of getting your films out, uh, you're screwed. So they, having destroyed the, or taken over the distribution of films, uh, then the outlet for American films was obviously extended, whereas the British films began to shrink. And the studios were, were sold off, or, you know, and, they, and the production companies, the big ones, Rank and so on, EMI, uh, went to, just disappeared, so there was no industry. So it was, it was, all, it was just very fragmented. Yeah. Um, and you... So you... In those days, a, a director of any quality would make a film every year you know but once that quality once that uh, that turnover had gone then you, you have no industry left basically so it is very still very fragmented you yeah. know each one each person's trying desperately to get the money to make the film but it's very piecemeal op for operation in the late 1990s you directed croupier with a wonderful performance by clive owen were you surprised by the film's success well, again, I, I suffered terribly from, in this country. I'm much more accepted in America and in France, for example, than I am here. Uh, Terminal Man was never distributed in this country. Mm -hmm. Although, say, Stanley Kubrick, for example, loved, loved it, for example. And they, they just decided the British audiences weren't sophisticated enough or, uh, to, to see this film. Um, Carter was sort of... Uh, initially was frowned upon by the... Uh, by the, the cultural elite in this country was too, too rough and too sexy and too, you know, too much of set in the gutter, basically. Yeah. So, uh, so that was not success. Pulp was accepted by the, you know, all sorts of people. But, uh, and I forgot what the question was. <laughs> what, was it? what was it again? Um, in the late 1990s, you directed oh. Croupier. Oh, that's Croupier. Yes. So, uh, so there, there isn't really, and there wasn't an industry then, uh, this was made for film four, which is sort of a small, you know, they, didn't, they put a, a small amount of money into yeah. each film and you had to match it to get it made. Um, and by this time I'd sort of decided that I wasn't going to write any more scripts. I've written a lot more scripts than I've ever got to make. Um, so uh, a fr very old friend of mine, Paul Marsberg, who worked a lot with Nicholas Rogue, had written the script. And it was suggested I would be the director and I'm very glad I... Did direct it. Now, Croupier, when I showed it to Film 4, uh, the person who commissioned it said the only thing he liked about the film was the end credits. So uh, I, it wasn't going to get distribution here. Well, what had happened was that, so again, my, my, in this country, I was being shunned again. So BFI were redistributing Get Carter with a new print and everything. And I went to them and said, well, look, would you release... Uh, croupier. Yeah. So the BFI have liked the film very much, so they released it, and therefore they saved it from going into uh, going straight to VHS. Meanwhile, in America, a friend who also worked with, with Kubrick a lot, Warner Brothers, he loved the film, and he over about a year and year and a half, he managed to get a distributor there, and. Uh, they, the deal was that they would go onto 17 screens in the whole of the United States for four weeks. And they, they were going to just show six films over a period of like two to three months. 
and Croupier be became it was amazing reviews and amazing reviews. And it just played on. It went on. It started at 17 screens and ended up like 200 screens, and it did incredibly well. Um, so the success, much to my surprise, happened from America. So yeah. then back here, Film Four decided that they would re-release it. But the film was never as successful here as it was in America or anywhere else for that matter. More recently, you have produced plays, novels, and you're also a painter. You once said, nobody can edit my painting. Are you disillusioned with cinema? No, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's the world, everything is now, uh, as you'll find out, is, is, uh, is highly competitive and fairly ruthless, you know, just about everything. Mm. Uh, we live in a world which is, uh, the gloves are off. And for people to survive uh, in any industry is hard. Um, so the film industry is no different. Do you think you'll ever direct another film? I hope so. I may just get to make one more, if I'm lucky. I'm 82 now, so it's, <laughs> uh, the odds are getting <laughs> narrower and narrower. But we've been 10 years trying to, this is what, what happens, you see. I've been 10 years trying to make two films that we've been running with, one by the same person who wrote I'll Sleep When I'm Dead, which is the last film I made with Clyde Byrne and Charlotte Rampling. And then uh, another film, written, the script was written in 1955 by a very famous American director called Abe Polanski. Polonsky. And Polonsky was blacklisted in the 60s and never got to make it. It's based on a Thomas Mann novella called Mario and the Magician. So we have an amazing cast, uh, but we just can't get the money together. So that's for taken up the last 10 years of my life. Mm. Luckily, I don't have to survive on the basis of earning my money in the film industry. <laughs> so there we are. Thank you for coming to speak to us today, Mike. You have been watching Conversations from DLD College in London.